Without further ado, can I now ask you to please be upstanding for the Royal College of Surgeons of England Council and Court of Examiners. Please be seated. <clears throat> a very, very warm welcome to all of the diplomates and to our special guests and especially to all the mums and dads, partners, significant others, friends, etc., etc. We hope you'll enjoy this afternoon. It's a very special celebration of your achievement and how hard you've worked. Tough getting into surgery and uh, we understand how tough it is. We need you for the future of surgery, so we want to celebrate this moment of achievement. Um, we have a slight military theme this afternoon, as you'll find out. But first of all, some of my colleagues have asked me to say something about this mace. So um, every time a new king or queen uh, is enthroned, so this will happen again, we have a new royal charter. And uh, the royal charter uh, created by King George IV allowed us for the very first time to have a president as opposed to a martyr, a uh, master. Martyr, yeah, it is a master. <laughs> I did that on purpose. So 1821, a royal charter allowing us to have a mace. Uh, and in fact, um, it was sent off to the goldsmiths. It's silver gilt, it's very precious. Uh, and uh, on July the 12th, 1822, it first lay on a cushion before a council meeting, and then ever since then, at every diplomate's day and every council meeting, the mace has been a symbol of our heritage, a symbol of the past, a symbol of where we've come from as surgeons, and helping us see that all those efforts that were made to improve surgery all the time, we've also got to be part of surgery's future. So when you came into the... Um, front hall and you signed in there, there was this picture, we've got a rather better version of it up on the screens here, of Henry VIII by Holbein, an original picture. He's giving the charter for the barber surgeons, the company of surgeons, to Thomas Vickery uh, in 1540. So we go back to creating surgery as a tradition to back then. Also in the front hall you saw a robot. Uh, that's the future of surgery and of course uh, robots are now massive news in our profession and all of us on the stage party and I just want to say thanks to all my colleagues for giving up their time to be with us today. Um, all of us on the stage party are really rather jealous of the future technical improvements and changes in surgery. Uh, on the opposite side of the hallway there is a marvellous marble statue of John Hunter, who practised in around the 1760s, 70s and 80s. He is our hero. He is the father of scientific surgery. He first made brilliant observations about both patients and speculations about how diseases happened. Remember, they didn't know about bacteria bacteria then, they didn't really know too much about how diseases happened. But he kept a journal. And uh, in keeping with our theme today, I'm going to read from his journal. It's a bit heavy. Um, this is around 1780, and this entry is called Bleeding at the Nose from a Leech, 
at Coimbra in Portugal. So he was the Surgeon General of the British forces at that time. Uh, and it's a story of a soldier in General Lambert's regiment was just recovered of a fever and got pretty strong. He was attacked with a violent, violent bleeding at the nose. They tried various really appalling things like making him bleed further and making him sick, which in those days were the treatments. They didn't work, uh, uh, surprisingly enough. But at last, uh, when uh, they tried to make him cough, uh, he coughed a leech into his mouth. Um, and uh, it says here, he spat it out and immediately uh, it showed the cause of the bleeding. Uh, all the time of the disease, I suspected some trick and ordered some persons to watch him, for it's very common for soldiers to try schemes to avoid duty. <laughs> Many of the horses were attacked in the same way, and we thought it was also leeches that caused it. Well, there we are, an observation about uh, military duties all the way back then. And, of course, in current times, with the Ukraine war going on, we're reminded that um, John Hunter, making those early observations of wounds and wound healing, uh, a war is often a crucible for surgical advance, uh, and we're going to hear a little bit about that uh, during uh, the rest of our uh, diplomat ceremony today. Um, so with that, once more, a very warm welcome, everybody. Um, we are now going to uh, present an honorary fellowship to uh, our guest today, uh, and uh, we're going to ask the Vice Presidents to bring him up, please. I'm going to ask Surgeon Captain Rory Rickard to read the citation, please. President, members of council, college fellows, members and guests, good afternoon. My name is Rory Rickard and it is my enormous pleasure to deliver a citation on the award of an honorary fellowship of this college to Captain, Professor, Dean, Dr. Eric Elster, formerly Chair and Norman M. Rich Professor of Surgery at the Uniformed Services University of the Health Sciences, USU, and Walter Reed National Military Medical Center in Bethesda, Maryland, and, Reece, and presently Dean of the Medical School at USU. Our two nations, the United Kingdom and the United States of America, are inextricably linked, historically, culturally, politically, economically, romantically, and of course, militarily. Students of history and of early 18th century American poetry will forgive me if I point out that my own service, the British Royal Navy, is forever enshrined in the United States national anthem, the Star Spangled Banner. In contrast to that brief interlude, however, we've always fought alongside each other, and we consider our, each other our closest ally. I've had the pleasure from the very start of my naval career working with American naval, military and air force doctors and nurses on operations abroad on one occasion in southern Helmand leading a contingent of US Army personnel looking after injured servicemen and women of both of our nations. More latterly during my tenure as your professor of military surgery Dr Elster and I reinvigorated a long-standing uh, bilateral exchange between the British Defence Medical Services and USU, giving it a strong research flavor. And I'm hugely grateful to Eric for the efforts that he went to, including securing special dispensation from a former Assistant Secretary of Defense to allow enrollment of British Naval and military surgical trainees into an accelerated PhD program at USU. To date, two Royal College Research Fellows have benefited, one successfully squeezing a five-year PhD into three years, and another currently on track to do the same. The short biographical sketch in your pamphlet certainly does not do justice to Dr. Elster's impressive career. A 1995 graduate of the University of South Florida School of Medicine, 
enjoyed internships in San Diego and Bethesda, residency in general surgery at the Bethesda Naval Hospital, and a solid organ transplantation fellowship next door at NIH. Operationally, he has served at the US Naval Hospital Yokosuka in Japan, in Okinawa, a ship surgeon on board the USS Kitty Hawk, which for those of you who don't know, was a 68,000 ton supercarrier with a crew of some 5,000, and more laterally, as Chief of Surgery at the Royal Three Medical Treatment Facility in Kandahar. It is also hard in the five minutes available to do justice to the breadth and depth of his achievements, but I'll pull out a few facts. As Chair of the Department of Surgery at USU from 2012, Captain Elster was responsible for leading a department of more than 400 and managing a $200 million budget. He led integration of, the, of his department at USU with the medical center and increased research funding from $8 million per annum to $120 million per annum, creating a visionary research program that averages more than 300 publications each year. And with our sister college, the American College of Surgeons, he has driven a revolution in US military clinical readiness in general surgery through codifying necessary knowledge, skills, and abilities. And he continues to serve as a governor of the American College and an executive co-chair of the US Military Health System ACS Strategic Partnership. Now, in June of last year, Captain Elster hung up his naval reefer jacket and moved into his new role as dean of the School of Medicine at USU, the nation's medical school. USU's motto is learning to care for those in harm's way. And his program offers not only a top tier medical degree, but also outstanding graduate education programs in public health, tropical medicine, health administration and policy, medical and clinical psychology, as well as interdisciplinary PhD programs, one of which I've touched on here. Now we've seen events in Eastern Europe in the last year that have only emphasized the bonds between our two nations and reinforced the importance of our shared democratic ideals and values. I have no doubt that future generations of American military medical officers of whichever armed service, educated through Dean Elster's vision and leadership, will at some point, in some part of the world, be looking after our own, after our injured British servicemen and women, people we know, our brothers and sisters, our sons and daughters. So I'm enormously grateful, therefore, to the college on behalf of the Defence Medical Services and all of those serving in harm's way now and in the future for honouring Dr Elster in this way. To Eric I say, this fellowship is very richly deserved and it is our honour that you are here to accept it. President, President, I present to you for admission as an honorary fellow of the college, Captain Professor Dr Dean Eric Elster. <laughs> Got to get the photograph right. So, Dr. Eric Elster, by the authority of council and the power vested in me as president of the Royal College of Surgeons of England, I'm absolutely delighted to admit you to honorary fellowship. It's a pleasure, sir. <laughs> Vice presidents, please. Thank you both very much. So Dr. Elsa will be addressing us a little later. We're now going to get on with the part of the ceremony where we actually give you your diplomas. Just thinking back, uh, it's amazing to remember the COVID times, the just after COVID recovery times. Everybody who came up this, on this stage had to bump elbows. We weren't allowed to shake hands. Just forget it so quickly. It's amazing, isn't it? And um, just to say, as you begin to go out, um, if mums or dads do want to come up here and take a photograph, as well as the official pho photographer, you're most welcome. So if we get on now with the arrangements, please, for the procession, that would be great. <coughs> Just while some of your colleagues are going out and thinking about COVID, uh, just worth me saying again, as I've often said at these diploma ceremonies, 
We haven't forget, forgotten the contribution many of you surgeons in training made during the COVID crisis. And my colleagues, the very head of the leadership in the Department of Health and NHS England and the other <coughs> devolved nations are always eternally grateful for the way in which you stepped up. So thank you very much. <coughs> and just to the mums and dads, partners, significant others, friends and all the rest of it, if you want to either whoop or yelp, please do. If you want to clap very loudly, please do. We'll have a chance to do that communally at the end. Uh, and once again, if you want to come and take pictures of the frontier, please do. And just while everybody's coming down, I'll re-recite <coughs> the story of one of our early DIPS days when I invited parents to come up and take photographs. It's usually uh, a parent who deeply embarrasses their uh, diplomate child. Uh, and um, one mum had shaken off her stiletto, stiletto heels. She ran all the way down the middle here. She actually came up on the, to the stage to take a photograph of this <coughs> boat. It's absolutely hilarious. So don't quite do that. I think we're ready. I think we're ready. President, I present to you Research Fellows. Anuja Tulip Mitra. <laughs> Visagan Ravindran. President, I present to you Senior Clinical Fellows. Oday Ghalib Hussein Al Asadi. <laughs> Khalid Abdullah Al Hurebi. Edward William Dyson. President, I present to you successful fellows in an intercollegiate speciality examination a fellow in cardiothoracic surgery. Mustafa Saber Saeed Snozi. <laughs> President, I present to you fellows in general surgery. Amar Reda Juma Al Lawati. Louise Sarah Onder. <laughs> Matthew James Lee. <laughs> Paul David McKenzie. William Allen Hamilton McLean. <laughs> Eloka Ogobegmubunam Okoye. <laughs> Adeline Claire Rankin.
Wasula Sampath Rathnawira. Katie Elizabeth Rollins. Emma Patricia Stewart Parker. Mr. President, I present you fellows in neurosurgery. Yasir Chowdhury. <laughs> Nikhil Amit Patel Raynet. President, I present you a fellow in oral and maxillofacial surgery. Catherine Kwokian Lau. <laughs> Mr. President. Mr. President, I present you a fellow in neurosurgery. Edward William Dyson. <laughs> Mr. President, I present you a fellow in otolaryngology. Ayesh Abdul Hamid. Sharma Shishodia. <laughs> Liam Sutton. Ramachandran Vetrivel Vedashalam. <laughs> President, I present to you fellows in plastic surgery. Nada Al Hadithi. Rima Chola. <laughs> Rebecca Spencer Nicholas. President, I present to you fellows in trauma and orthopedics. Wahid Abdul. <laughs> Naveen Bala Subramanian. <laughs> Akshdeep Singh Bawa. Albert Chicate. <laughs> Dr. 
Anthony Eggleston. <laughs> Nabil El Mala. <laughs> Ahmed El Said Yosef Galoum. James Arthur Geddes. <laughs> Abdelmonem Hassan Eid Abdelmonem. <laughs> Sarah McCartney. Noman Shaquille Niazi. <laughs> Ronak Patel. <laughs> Sharif El Sayed Fetu Raka. Prashant Singh. Thomas David Steltzhammer. Adam Stoneham. President, I present to you a fellow in urology. David Stephen John Ellis. <laughs> President, I present to you fellows in vascular surgery. Ahmed El Said Ahmed El Basti. Abilash Sudarsanam. <laughs> President, I present to you a fellow ad eundem. Marcus Sforza. President, I present to you successful candidates at recent examinations for membership of the Royal College of Surgeons of England. Diplomates from the University of Zawiya in Libya, University of Dhaka in Bangladesh, University of Bristol, Cardiff University, Alexandria University in Egypt, Cairo University in Egypt, and the Fatima Jinnah Medical <coughs> University in Pakistan. Mawa Ahmed. Fiona Bonzi. <laughs> Kirsty Cole. Mohammed Gamal Tolba Syed Ahmed El Gaza. You, 
Ben Jones. <laughs> Ahmed Mohammed. Hector Sahan Lawrence Pereira. Annabelle White. Mr. President, I present you diplomats from uh, the Manipal Academy of Higher Education in India, the University of Leeds, the University of Galway in Ireland, Imperial College London, the University of Kalania in Sri Lanka, Khyber Medical College in Pakistan, University of Liverpool, University of Mumbai in India, and the Rajiv Gandhi University of Health Sciences in India. Tanya Bala. William Bolton. Ara Farage. Botolage Sandun Chamika Fernando. Asif Halim. <laughs> Thomas Handley. <laughs> Darren Myatt. Ramprasad Rajabasale. <laughs> Mohammed Shahid. Mr. President, I present to you diplomates from the University of Baghdad, Iraq, Islamic University of Gaza, the University of London, Sri Siddhartha Medical College, India, Regia Strandis University, Latvia, University of Warwick, University of Buckingham Medical School, University College, London Medical School. Ali Kudair Ade Al Jamali. Said Al Yakubi, <laughs> Nicholas Harrison, <laughs> Shazia Jalil. Madara Kronberger. <laughs> Emily Kate Matthews. <laughs> Kaif Kayum.
Charlene Sathanantham. Ahmed Akhil Shakir. <laughs> Sri Sivarajan. President, I present to you successful candidates in recent examinations for membership of the Royal College of Surgeons of England via the ENT Root Medical School. Sarah Chu. <laughs> Shadia Hashim Kurichil. Ali Raza Sherazi. John Plankat Yarrow. President, I present to you fellows and members in absentia. Arnab Mohanty. <laughs> David Jonathan Holroyd. <laughs> Victor Kung. <laughs> Kayo Krishnakant Shah. <laughs> Nadir Tukan. <laughs> Indranil Pal. Sandeep Patel, Christopher Down, Mohammed Al Muharaki, Youssef Atta, Constantine Azemi, Mohammed Habib, Stephen Labib. David Rowland. Thank you. Now we just need a little bit of audience participation, please. I don't think you clapped loud enough. I want all the people on this side of the room and those right at the back, that is parents, supporters, friends, and uh, partners, etc. Please stand up on this side of the room, will you please? I want you to give a big round of <coughs> applause to the diplomates. Uh, uh, all those at the back as well, yes please, all you, yep, all you stand up as well, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Uh, so we can all, in one big loud clap, uh, recognise their achievement. Thank you very much. If you sit down now, all you guys could stand up, please. And uh, your parents, friends, and <coughs> supporters have often given up much, both emotional and sometimes uh, physical, financial energy to support you in your struggle to get this far. Big round of applause to them, please.
very much. If you'd be seated, that'd be absolutely lovely. Um, thank you. I'm now going to ask Dr. Eric Elsa to come and give his address, please. Well, first uh, and foremost, congratulations. You know, uh, sitting here and watching this, and I do this for our graduates, it's like 100 smiling faces uh, and well-deserved. We all know how hard it is to be at this point. I was asked to provide some advice to you, the next generation in the future, in the future of surgery. First, I'll comment on what I've learned from my clinical experience as a military general and transplant surgeon. How this has informed my approach to decision making as a leader and how both were refined in that crucible of war that you mentioned before. But realizing, uh, you know, that I am standing between you and T, which is obviously important, uh, I'll take the advice of our President Roosevelt when giving formal comments. I'll be concise, I'll be polite, and then I'll be seated. Uh, as I mentioned, as a military uh, general and transplant surgeon, I've learned three things uh, that are critical to, to my success and I think your future success. Uh, and these three things are not technical in nature. They relate to judgment, not to say the things that we do technically aren't critical. I'm a transplant surgeon. I get one shot at that vascular anastomosis. So I understand the criticality of the technical part of surgery. But what you're, going to do, what you're going to develop over the next five to 10 years and throughout your career is the judgment part of surgery. And that boils down to three things. So I'm going to, and I'm going to ask you to remember eight things during my brief remarks. But those th these three things are one of those pieces. Number one, when do you go to the operating theater? Sometimes it's the hardest decision you can make is when not to go to the operating theater. So one, when do you go to the operating theater? Number two. What do you do in the operating theater when things don't go swimmingly, when things don't go according to plan, when the, you're putting a truck car in for that minimally invasive case using that beautiful robot downstairs and there's a hole in the inferior vena cava? How do you approach that? What's your thought process and what maneuvers? And then finally, what do you do in the operating, what do you, when do you go back to the operating room? You've done the case, the patient's on the ward. Is it time to go back to the operating room? All those three decisions are critical to your success as clinicians. When do you go to the operating room? When do you, what do you do in the operating room when things don't go according to plan? And when do you go back? And I'll weave into how that has helped define my role as a leader. And as a leader in surgery and in medicine, I've learned through observation of great leaders, and I've had the pleasure of working for great leaders, but also a fair amount of bad leaders and probably have learned as much as not more from poor leaders. And I've distilled my approach to leadership into a few key points based out of that clinical experience. And I'll explain that, I'll explain that in a moment. So with re respect to making decisions, because if you're a leader, you're asked to make decisions all of the time. So my approach is as follows. Number one, I listen. I really listen. And uh, I learned to listen from my mentor during my transplant fellowship, who one day on, the, uh, on rounds either at Walter Reed or the NIH, he said to me, Eric, I know you're smart. Sometimes you may be the smartest person in the room, but sometimes stop talking and listen, really listen. So I encourage you to listen, number one. Number two, learn. If you're gonna make a decision, learn. Now, we're surgeons, we can, make, we can learn pretty quickly, but you got to learn. And then you make your decision. And then you empower the people that you work with to carry out that decision. And then you come back to them and say, how did the decision go? And then you recover. And that comes back to that approach from the clinical world that I just mentioned. <coughs> when do you go to the operating room? What do you do in the operating rooms if things don't go swimmingly? When do you go back? The ability to recover. For example, you listened, you learned, you made the decision to go the, through the door on the right. You empowered someone to walk through that door on the right. What'd you find on the other side? If it was the wrong decision, okay, wipe yourself off and go through the other door. So when it comes to leadership and decision-making, listen, learn, decide, empower, and recover. Now for me, both of these were tested in that crucible of conflict that we mentioned a few minutes ago when I was deployed to Afghanistan alongside my UK colleagues. 
and, and just a little bit of context uh, for you with respect to that. That was 2010 to 2011. I found myself a very young surgeon in my early 40s, the chief of surgery at our, one of our largest combat hospitals in theater. Uh, in a scope of six months, we did 3,000 operations on 1,000 patients. Uh, mostly more than 50%, uh, more than 70% U.S. and coalition forces. Uh, we gave 5,000 units of blood. We did 90, 90 mass air transfusions. And our survival rate was an astonishing 97%. If you showed up with vital signs, you survived. Uh, and it was a remarkable achievement. And it was not, at co it was not without cost. It was a marathon. It wasn't a sprint. In combat, there are no days off. We did a mass casualty every single week. Rory can remember those times. Uh, and for me, that crucible distilled the, the, th the things that I just spoke about, the approach to the operating room and the approach to leadership. Uh, and you know, in a situation like that, and I personally did about over 200 major cases, you go there, a good surgeon, transplant surgeon, you leave a master because you, know, because you refine that, that your technical skill and that approach to judgment on a daily basis with among the most complex patients. But the leadership piece was probably the most challenging. How do you keep people every single day on their game when there are no days off, as I mentioned? And, and that distillation of listen, learn, decide, uh, empower and recover, you know, didn't come on the fly. It was tested in that crucible of conflict. So I encourage you all as our future leaders to take those lessons and apply them because truly the future is in your hands. I encourage you as surgeons to be leaders. Don't leave the leadership to other members of our profession. You need to lead uh, because the way you're trained and your way you think lends itself very nicely uh, to what we just talked about. So finally, I want to thank Professor Ricard, uh, who sponsored me, who really defines that, that special relationship we have between the US and UK. And, and that special relationship in medicine is, is mostly is best defined by the relationship we have in surgery. I'd also like to thank Professor Lair and his wife, Jenny, uh, for their contributions to our American College surgeons and that relationship, our MACE, came from the Royal College in the American College of Surgeons. You know, and finally, I look forward to serving as a bridge between our great nations. This world is a very volatile and complex case, place. And unfortunately, I am sure we will find ourselves across one another in the operating tables in the, in the future, and probably sooner than you think. So with that, thank you all for this great honor. It truly is one of the great privileges of my career. Thank you. Now, Vice President Tim Goodacre is going to give a vote of thanks. Thank you, Tim. Wow. If you haven't been uh, inspired by that, I think uh, it would be a hard call to, to know what would inspire you. And Captain, uh, Professor, Dr. Eric Elster, thank you so much for what you have just given to the next generation. I think there can't be many of us up here who wouldn't rather... Uh, faced with the future that you've described in surgery, be down there with our careers again. And uh, it's a wonderful career that you're heading for. You, we started today's ceremony with a military story from John Hunter. And I think it's only fitting that, that uh, we have ended with a vast military experience that you've developed and you've reflected on so inspiringly for us. You've brought to us rich wisdom from your vast experience. And there were so many nuggets. I think all of us up here were probably nodding uh, in the re reflecting on our practice and just thinking how, how wise so many of your comments were. Learning from, you are going to be leaders, but learning that there are good and bad leaders, and you've learned as much from seeing bad leadership to, uh, uh, in that. And you have learned from soldiering as well as being a leader in civilian medical school life, so we thank you for that. 
remember those points. I tried to note them down very quickly, when to go to the operating theater, what to do when things go wrong, what, when do you take a patient back, and what qualities did you need to remember, to be listeners, to learn from that listening, and to empower other, others, and to recover. Inspiring or overall, most of us, your experience, your rich experience of surgical practice will be an inspiration to, and the envy of many. Many will not have such opportunities to develop the expertise that you have done in the field. And we're not saying that all of you should have no time off in your, but, but we do know that when the chips were down in the COVID, in the pandemic and so forth, you took no time off, many of you. Uh, you, you, you rose to the, ch to the challenge, and there will be those challenges again. So uh, thank you for inspiring our next generation in their future careers. Thank you for inspiring them to be leaders and to be listeners. And thank you for offering to be part of this great bridge between our nations and in the future. Let's hope and pray that uh, we don't need uh, the, the resources that perhaps you, you, you allude to in, in military terms. But thank you for building those bridges and helping us. So thank you very much for honoring us today with your, your presence and for that talk. Thank you, Tim, very much. Just two last words from me about John Hunter. So John Hunter's statue downstairs is often the place where many of you have your pictures taken and will remember the college for. Just opposite is going to be opening in April, May time, the new Hunterian Museum. And it tells the story of surgery right from the beginning of John Hunter's time until today, with uh, absolutely up-to-date modern robots in there too. Um, I hope you'll come back and see the Hunterian Museum. I hope you'll come back to the college many, many times, maybe virtually some of them, maybe actually in practice the others too. We'd like you to see this as your professional home for surgery in the future. So with that, I'd ask everybody in the room please to be upstanding while the stage party uh, processes out of the room. Thank you very much. <coughs>